Good morning, church. How we doing? We doing good? Let's all stand together as we open up in a word of prayer. God, we are here for you and you alone. Lord, we thank you that your presence is here in this place even now, desiring to meet with each of us. And Lord, we are here to meet with you. Lord, we thank you that in you we, can, we find belonging. That we can stand firm, immovable, knowing that we belong to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so, Lord, we pray, Father, that you would do whatever you want to do today, God, that you would change hearts, that you would transform us to be more and more like you, God. We are here to worship you in spirit and in truth. We love you so much, and it's in your name we pray, and everybody says, amen. Let's worship together. God of impossible, amen. 
And so this morning we can say the name of Jesus. We can worship the name of Jesus in confidence. The true and living God reigns and he rules. Amen. just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus and I just want to speak the name Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Listen to this out Cause your name is power Your name is Jesus Jesus Christ. 
every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus
our lives upon. It's you, Lord. We look to you, God, for our peace. You are a refuge in the struggles and the trials of life. It's you, Lord. It's all you, Jesus. And so, God, we pray that you would be, you would continue to be magnified in this place, God, that your name would be exalted in every heart here, Lord, that they would see you, Jesus, in a different way this morning, God. I pray that as your word goes out with power, that you would speak to every one of us, Lord. Um, we've, we've come to hear from you, Lord. We've come to hear from you. Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. We pray over Pastor Eric as he gives the word, uh, that it would go out with boldness. Empower him, Lord Jesus, um, to speak the truth to us in love this morning. Our faithful God, our faithful faithful Lord Jesus. It's in your name that we say amen. everyone, welcome to Calvary Chapel West Grove. We're so excited that you're here with us today. Especially if you're new or visiting with us, we just want to take a few minutes to invite you on what God's doing in our church community and how you can be a part of it. Hey ladies, we just want to invite you to our women's retreat. It's May 17th through the 19th. And our heart, just as a women's ministry, is that we would grow deep in the calling and the purpose that God has placed in our lives. And so we hope that you'll not only come, but also connect with the women around you. The cost is $320. It's at Forest Home Conference Center. And you can just visit us at ccwg.org or visit us at the ccwg.org kiosk to register. We hope to see you there. Okay, man, it's that time of the year again. It's Men's Retreat 2024 from September 6th to September 8th at Big Bear Lake Christian Camp and Conference Center. Men of all ages and stages are invited to a life-changing weekend filled with rest in God's presence, getting built up in God's word for your life, and being encouraged by like-minded brothers. Now the cost is $195 with a $25 deposit due at registration, which covers everything, meals, lodging, and materials. 
You can also make payments or pay in full at registration. Now, space is limited, so reserve your spot online for the Men's Retreat 2024. Hope to see you there. God bless. Hey church, what's going on? This is a quick update for the team that's going out to Uganda, July 8th through the 17th. So far, we have around 14 people registered to go on the trip. So we're asking right now for you to pray. Pray for those that are coming. Pray for our fruitful time that when we get to Uganda, all the things are going to be happening. Um, if you can cover this trip in prayer, we'd much appreciate it. This is also an opportunity for you to send, for you to come alongside those that are raising support. There's going to be opportunities uh, from the church, within the church, opportunities for you to give, uh, to help contribute to those that are raising funds. But then also, this is the last call for anyone that would like to come on the trip. So April 14th is going to be our cutoff date. If you've been on the fence, man, let's get you registered. I'll put a deposit down for your trip and let's get you on this trip. So if you're interested, you can find out all the information on ccwg.org. You can put your deposit down there, reserve your spot. We'd love to hear from you. To get more information on what you just heard and more, you can visit our website at ccwg.org or you can visit the ccwg.org kiosk in the lobby. And whether you're here in person or online, you can fill out a connection card so we can help you get plugged into our church. And if you're a follower of Jesus who calls this church home, you can continue your worship through financial giving. Thanks again for joining us today. We're so excited that you're here and a part of our church family. And so we just wanna invite you right now just to stand up and to be family. And would you turn around and greet one another? Good morning, Calvary Chapel West Grove. So good to see each and every single one of you guys, whether you're here in person online or in the fellowship hall. He is risen. You know, I've been thinking about that this week. There was such an excitement and just such a zeal that we had last week. And the Lord just reminded me of the fact that the same power that rose Christ from the grave is alive in us every single day. Amen? And so and for us, it, it wears off and then it comes back, but it doesn't have to be like that. You know, we can have that same excitement. I was, and that's why I believe when God pointed his little children. He said, like, we need to have faith like one of these. And they have that childlike faith. You can take to a, a kid to the same park and the same slide will be the same excited face every single time for a matter of years. You can take them and it's like the first time they've ever went down that slide and it could be the hundredth time or even sometimes the same day, right? I want to go on a slide again. You think that it would get tired. You think that they would get old and they just keep going. They keep going. And I think that's the love and the joy that we need to have that childlike faith. Every day we wake up, it's like, wow, he is risen. I'm alive because he's alive. And so my encouragement is even as we're talking about that, that that same excitement we have would be every single day, that every day would be Resurrection Sunday, because really it is, amen? And so I'm excited to get into God's word. We're starting First Peter, um, but before we do, I, that last announcement, how many of you guys were listening to that announcement about Africa? Some of you guys, when he said, and if you've been on the fence, he was talking to somebody, and I know you were sitting there, you, you probably shook when he said it. I'm going to see who it is, and I know that there's people that are praying about going on that. That was like a little encouragement, and uh, man, God might be calling you to go, and how exciting, and uh, even as he made an announcement, if you've been on the fence, I'm thinking, oh wow, there's somebody on the fence right now, and so man, step out and see what the Lord would do as you're faithful to go to Africa. Africa changed my life. That was a mission trip that I realized that I was white and, um, you know, <laughs> not by choice. My own people wouldn't accept me, you know, and, uh, but it's all good. So, man, just go and just see what the Lord would do as we get into the mission field. But today we're in 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 6 through 9 this morning in a message called Reasons to Rejoice. Peter is writing this letter. The whole purpose of this letter is to encourage, to build up, to equip, and encourage believers, specifically those who were in the Asia Minor era era area so that was asia minor was modern day turkey but it wasn't just for them it was for all of us to encourage us to to build this up now the believers that he's writing to here this letter they were going through major persecution 
a lot of suffering and just trials and tribulations under the evil rule of Caesar Nero, who might have been one of the most evil rulers of all time. He literally, at this time that this letter was being written, was burning Christians as a torch to light up his area where he lived. It was just a very, very evil and wicked man and a very evil rule in a time of difficulty for Christians. And so Peter's message throughout this letter is that there could still be victory throughout the suffering that there could still be joy, that there still can be peace and love, all these things that we have in Christ, that it's possible to have all of that even in the midst of trials and tribulations. And so we'll see that today as he gives in these few short verses reasons to rejoice. And so let's jump in in verse 6 of chapter 1 where it says this. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. So that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but you still believe in him. Greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls." So encouraging to a group of believers, as you can imagine, right out the gate as he begins to build them up, knowing where they're at, knowing what they're going through, and yet he's encouraging them time and time again to greatly rejoice. What a message, even if we just close our Bibles right now, for us here today. No matter what we're going through, what trials and tribulations, the encouragement, the command, the exhortation in the word of God is to greatly rejoice. And that's what we see in verse 6, how he begins this text with the encouragement. If you have your own Bible, circle that. Greatly rejoice. That's a command that is such a a beautiful one that we are called to do by our Lord and Savior. There's false religions. There's cults all around the world that are being commanded by their spiritual leaders to do all sorts of evil and wicked things. But our God, our great Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we see here, is commanding us to greatly rejoice. That phrase, greatly rejoice, in the Greek by definition means exceedingly glad or exuberantly jubilant. And that is what he wants us to be in the midst of any and everything. Exuberantly glad or exuberantly jubilant, we are to greatly rejoice. Now this is a kind of joy, this is a kind of jubilee or gladness that Peter is talking about that doesn't come from temporal shallow things, but comes from a deep personal relationship with Jesus. Because that is where joy is found. That is where the source of our joy is found in Christ. And it can't be found in temporal things because it would be a contingent on how things are going temporally when we can have joy eternally now and forever. You think about Jesus' interaction with the woman at the well who was broken and it was an outcast amongst outcasts, persecuted, trials, tribulations. All those things were adjectives to describe that which this woman was going through. But yet she was at this well and Jesus went to there and he met her there and he said, what you're looking for, you continue to drink water, you will thirst again. But if you drink what I give you, you will never again thirst. And the picture there is we're going around looking for satisfaction, looking for joy, looking for all the things that we desire and that we want and that we crave, but we're looking for it in the wells of this world. And it is only found in Christ. And so if we wouldn't even begin to adhere or to partake or to really be obedient to this calling to greatly rejoice, we have to be able to understand where our joy, where our jubilee, and where our gladness comes from. It comes from Christ and a deep personal relationship with him and him alone. And so this command to greatly rejoice would have been encouraging As you can imagine, knowing that their friends, their family members, they themselves were being persecuted, burned at the stake because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And so right out the gate, in Peter's first letter to them, he's encouraging them to greatly rejoice. For a moment, they would have been built up, encouraged. Wow, it's possible to rejoice, to be jubilant, to have joy in the midst of all of these things. It would have been encouraging for them. But also, I pray and hope that it's encouraging for us today, that no matter what we're going through, it's possible to be greatly rejoicing in any and everything. 
Because as we talked about, they were going through it. And maybe some of us today, maybe not going exactly through what they are, but we know what going through it feels like today. We feel like trials and tribulations and difficulty and hurts and heartaches and all those things. We can feel what they are feeling. And so the encouragement today, I hope it fills your hearts and you don't miss it, is to greatly rejoice no matter what you're going through. And this is an idea. This is a truth of joy in the midst of suffering. Being able to greatly rejoice in the midst of difficulty. This is something that is unique to Christianity. No other place, no other teaching, no other religion can preach this type of message. And we see this from Genesis to Revelation. The idea that, yes, there will be difficulty, but be of good cheer. How can I cheer and difficulty? It's something that is only reconciled in a relationship with Christ and our faith and Christianity. Nowhere else can you find it. Nowhere else can your situation be changed like that. When you're going through it, but yet you still have joy you're broken, but yet still you're alive. And all these different things only come together in Christ. There's teachers and college campuses and, and counselors and secular, and they're giving you tools to try to change or to forget your situation. But God is saying, I could bring peace and joy in the midst of it right here, right now. So this is something that is unique. And I love that. And we need to remember that. But they're still going through it. And I love how Peter doesn't just tell them to greatly rejoice and dismiss what they're going through because their struggle, their pain was real. They were going through it. They were dying for their faith. The persecution, the trials, and the tribulations that they were enduring were real, and he acknowledges it. He speaks to it in verse 6 when he says, I know that you've been distressed by various trials. He starts by saying greatly rejoice, but then he doesn't just pretend like their pain's not real, like it's not there. That's not healthy by any way, shape, or form. To show the magnitude and to help us understand how real their trials were, that word that he used to stress right here can also be translated as heavy. There was literally a heaviness, a distressness about what they were going through. And that word distressed and, and heavy, depending on the translation. It is the same word that described where Jesus was in Luke chapter 22, when it literally says that there was blood, come, blood droplets sweating from his forehead. It's the same word. That heaviness that Jesus felt as he was in the garden of Gethsemane, knowing what he was getting ready to endure, knowing the road that he was getting ready to walk on the way to Calvary with the shadow of the cross looming over him, how he felt. And that moment is exactly what they were feeling, that kind of heaviness. That is the weight of the trials that they were going through. And so he speaks to it. He doesn't pretend like it's not there. But he's saying in the midst of that place, you can have joy. And that's how Jesus was able to say, as we read in the book of Hebrews, where he was able to say, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. There was joy on that journey that he walked. And so we can have peace in the midst of anything and everything. And that's something that is only found in Christ. You can talk to people and secular humanism will try to get you to, to change and to pretend like things aren't there and to speak things into existence, to, to speak into reality what you want and to change it. And you can go through all these different mantras and think that there's really bringing forth change, but it doesn't. It's temporary. It's temporal. It doesn't matter how many times. I wish that was true. I wish that you could just look in the mirror every day and you are strong and you are beautiful and that I would turn away and feel strong and beautiful. You will have hair. <laughs> you, it's not meant to be funny. I don't know why. So, grow. No matter how much gusto I can, I can work up and no matter how much strength that I can try to muster up, it doesn't change the reality. It's elementary in thinking. It's false and it's wrong. I remember when I was really young, I used to play hide and go seek. I was like 16. And I thought if I could just close my eyes that nobody would see me. I thought, wow, how did you find me? I had my eyes closed. I didn't see anything. Thinking it. So we have that same mentality, that same approach, like the trial, the tribulation, that which is distressing us isn't there, it's there. But what Christ says, what Peter's saying is, I don't care that it's there. We can greatly rejoice. 
and have joy even though it's there. And so to those going through it that he's writing to and us here today, no matter what we're going through, Peter says you can greatly rejoice. Now, of course, a question that would naturally arise, a question that would come from anyone who was going through what they were going through, a question that would naturally arise from some of us here today that are going through what we're going through is how can we greatly rejoice? What do we have to greatly rejoice about? Pastor, you have no idea what I'm going through. Pastor, you have no idea the state of my marriage. We are on the verge of divorce. What do I have to greatly rejoice about? Pastor, you have no idea. Tomorrow I'm probably going to get laid off. I'm going to lose my job. I got kids to feed. I got a family to support. I don't know how I'm going to do it. You have no idea the relationship with my kids. You have no idea the relationship with my parents. Whatever it may be, the command is to greatly rejoice. But what do we have to rejoice about? It is the answer to this question that I believe Peter not only gives to those he's writing to, but us here today, four reasons that we can rejoice. Four reasons to rejoice in the midst of anything and everything. To find the first reason to rejoice we will look at today, we have to look back. And we know this because of what Peter said in verse 6 when he said, in this greatly rejoice. In what? And so when Peter said in this, he was referring to a previous point that he had just made that would cause and give all of us here and those he's writing to there a reason to greatly rejoice. And that point that he had made we see in verse 3 and 4. But that point was that we have a living hope through the resurrection and that because of the resurrection, we have an inheritance and a place in heaven. Let's read verse three together where it says this, same chapter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved for us, in heaven. And so the first reason that we can rejoice, simply put, he's letting them and us here today know that no matter what we're going through presently, we have a heavenly hope and a home awaiting for us. And because of that, that's a reason to rejoice. Because this isn't it. There's more to life than this. And not only do we have a hope that we're waiting for, we have a living hope now, knowing that it's coming. And to really understand that, we have to understand really what biblical hope is. Because the word hope that we use in our English language, it's weak at best. We hope a lot of things. We hope we win the lottery. We hope that this happens or, or that happens. The majority of the things that we hope for don't happen because there's no power, there's nothing behind them. You know? When I used to do a lot of, you know, when I was in youth ministry, whether it was junior high or high school, I hope this girl likes me. I hope that he asks me to prom. I hope I, all these different things, whatever it may be, it's, it's weak. There's nothing behind it. But biblical hope is best described in the Spanish version of hope, which the Spanish word for hope is esperanza. And that word esperanza, it means expectantly waiting. It's on the way. It's not the same as the English word hope. No, it's on the way. It's already coming. And what we see here is we have a living hope. We have an inheritance. It's on the way. As day by day goes by, our hope gets more and more real. And so we see here, we have a reason for hope because we have a, having a living hope because of the resurrection. There's more to life than this. And so he's writing them and he says, look, this is the first reason that you can greatly rejoice. The second reason to rejoice in the midst of trials and tribulations that Peter points out to them and us is found in verse 6 where he says that the trials that they're going through and the trials that we are going through, they're only for a little while. And that's good news. That's reasons to rejoice. How comforting it must have been for them to hear this, to read this, that the trials, the tribulations, the persecutions, everything that they were enduring, it wouldn't be like this forever seeing their friends and their loved ones die and get persecuted, all those things must have been so difficult. So to know that it was only for a little while, that it wouldn't be forever was encouraging, but that same encouragement for them is for us as well. But a natural response to that phrase, a little while, is, man, pastor, 
I've been going through it. I've been dealing with this. I've been suffering. I've been going through the trials and tribulations, but it doesn't seem like a little while. And that word little while, there's really no time behind it. What is a little while? Pastor, a little while, I've been going through this for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And so that little while is kind of subjective in our, in our human time. And the first thing I would say to that is one day is like a thousand in God's eyes. He's outside of time and space. And so what seems like so long to us, it's a little while in his idea. But the other thing to know about a little while, in comparison to the grand scheme of eternity, however long we are enduring and going through it, it pales compared to eternity. And that's what the Apostle Paul understood. That this little while, that this life is but a vapor. It's here today and gone tomorrow. And so for eternal ideas, we can't think of the temporal. We think of the eternal. So no matter what we're going through compared to eternal things, it will be a little while. And that's what the Apostle Paul meant when he was writing to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting in verse 14, 16, it's on the board, it says this, Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary, light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The Apostle Paul described what he was going through as light affliction. You don't have to do a deep dive into the Apostle Paul's life to understand and to see that which he was going through, that which he endured, the trials and tribulations that he went through were nothing light. But he understood in the grand scheme of things they were light. And he said, these trials that I'm going through aren't even worth being compared to the glory that will be revealed to me eternally. So he's able to understand their light and their temporal compared to how much glory and the eternal things that await me. And so it's just a little while. We're here today and gone tomorrow. The trials that we're dealing with today will be gone tomorrow. Everything will fade away when we see Jesus face to face for eternity. Things of this world don't matter much. So what's the worst case? The worst case is the trial that you're going through right now, the tribulation that you're enduring and facing, the heaviness that you're carrying. The worst case for us as a believer is that we will go through these heavy, heavy trials until we see Jesus. And again, I, I, I don't wish that upon anyone. I hope no one has to endure. I hope your little while ends today. But if the worst case, you carry it, 50, 60, 70, 80 years. You will not be thinking about that for even a moment in eternity with Christ. But what about now? Well, the good news is he doesn't just say, wait till you see me for those things to fade away. The apostle Paul, one of the most godly men that we read about, he had a trial that he was going through and time and time again, he said, Lord, let the little while be done. Take this away from me. It's too heavy. Please take it away. God didn't take it away, but he gave him something else, and it was his grace. He said, my grace will be sufficient for you. Grace is unmerited, undeserved favor, and so no matter what we're going through now, no matter how long the little while is, he will give us his grace. And that's good. He said, my grace is sufficient. He knows what we need. He knows what's good for us. And he says, I will give you my grace. And so I see you face to face, and then you won't even worry about those trials, those light afflictions, won't even be worth be compared to the glory that you will have for eternity. Grace was something that was woven time and time again throughout this letter. Every single chapter in this letter that he's writing to those who are afflicted, grace is mentioned at least once. And so his grace is good, and because it's only for a little while, it gives us a reason to rejoice. The third reason to rejoice is because Trials are needed. Trials are necessary, as we see in verse 6 when it says, they were necessary. I wish that wasn't the case. I wish they weren't necessary. I wish they weren't needed. I don't enjoy them. But at the same time, this gives us a reason to rejoice. It's a blessing to know, and we can rejoice for them and for us, knowing that the trials, that what they were going through wasn't fruitless, and it wasn't purposeless that it was necessary, that it was 
Some good was going to come out of it. But a question that arises, why are these things necessary? Why are these trials? Why is this persecution? Why is it necessary? Why is it needed? And what do they do? We find the answer to that question in verse 7, where Peter, writing to them, says that trials prove our faith, or depending on the translation, prove our faith or show the genuineness of our faith through the testing of or by fire. And so we see here in verse 7 why they're needed why they're necessary and one of the reasons that god allows and one of his purposes in allowing trials is to test as it says by fire our faith to test now i don't like tests i never have after kindergarten after it took true or false or yes or no once that was out of the way i didn't ever enjoy tests but the older i get i've realized that tests are good talking to teachers i've realized teachers will teach a subject or a block of a topic, whether it's a week or a month, at the end of that teaching, they want to test their students to see if they're comprehending, if they're learning, if they're picking up what they are teaching. And so tests are good. They show the student where they're at. They show them so they can have an idea. That is the purpose of tests. But it's important for us to understand that the tests that God allows us to go through, they're not to show God how we're going to do. It's not like, okay, I'm going to give Eric a test today. I wonder how he's going to do. Oh, he failed. Bummer. No, he already knows. The tests aren't to show God, but they're to show us and to reveal us the genuineness, the realness of our faith, to show us where we are. Just, and that's good. We want to know where we are. I'm sorry, well, I can be accountable on my own. No, you can't. We're terrible at that. We always think we're further along than we really, really are. And so it's good to show us time and time again, I find myself when when I'm tested by the fire, I'm like, wow, I cannot believe that I'm still struggling with that. I'm still going through that. Because when we're squeezed, when we go through the fire, what's inside is going to come out. And it's good to see. Never met one person who there's just part of us. It's, it's natural. It's our nature. We think that we're further along than where we are. So God tests us to show us. And that's good. The genuine is where we are. And so that's one of the reasons to rejoice because they're necessary. They show us where we are. Another reason I believe that trials are necessary and why God puts us through the fire is to refine us. This is important to know. So the tests are to show us, they're necessary to show us, but also we go through the fire, it's important for us to know that he's not putting us through the fire to cause hurt, to to cause harm, but rather to refine us and to make us more and more like him. And so when we talk about fire and and the refiner, and even as he mentions gold, gold here, the same effect that fire has on gold When gold is refined by the fire, it removes all the impurities, all the imperfections, and it makes it more pure as the the fire hits the gold. The same thing with the fiery trials do to our faith. They remove the impurities. They make us more and more like him. They refine us. And Job understood that. Job has went through more things maybe in one day than most of us will go through in our whole life. And he didn't get upset, he didn't get bitter, he didn't get angry, he came to understand this very principle. In Job chapter 23, he said, when God tried me, same word, tested, when God tested me, I came forth as gold. So he knew, he's refining me. Impurities, imperfection, more pure comes from fire. These fiery trials that I go through, so they're necessary and needed to show me and to grow me. And so they're good. And because of that, there is a reason to rejoice. And so we can greatly rejoice knowing that God is refining us and making us more and more like him through the fiery trials. And so we rejoice. God, you're showing me and you're growing me, and that's good. James understood this. James chapter 1. That's why he was able to say in the very beginning of his letter, he said, count it all joy when we fall into various trials. Why? Because he understood that they were doing something. That's why the Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Rome, in Romans chapter 5, he said, exalt in trials. 
Peter understood it. James understood it. The Apostle Paul understood that trials are for our good. They're teaching us things and they're working things in us. They're showing us and they're growing us. And that's for our good. And that's a reason to rejoice. Even when we don't know, even when we don't see it, God's working. Even when we don't see and understand, God, what you're showing me and how you're growing me, we don't, he never said we have to see it, but we have faith, even as Romans 8, 28 says, all things are working together for good. It doesn't say that you will see all things work together for good, but it says it will. And so, God, when you're showing me and you're, and you're growing me through the fire, I know you're doing something, God. And so I trust you and I rejoice. It gives me a reason to rejoice in the midst of these trials. And so it's through the fire that our faith is tested and purified. And these are things that are necessary for a believer to go through that we couldn't experience. God couldn't show us and he couldn't grow us when everything was smooth. It's impossible. There are certain things that we can see that God can teach us when we go through trials and tribulations. And for that, we can rejoice through the tests, through the trials, and through the fire. It's during those times that our faith is proven, strengthened, and purified, which is why that's a reason to rejoice. The fourth and final reason to rejoice was that through all the trials, those who he's writing to in Asia Minor, it says that they still had love and faith. And as we know, that's difficult because when the fiery trials hit and when we're going through difficulties and tough times, many, the natural temptation is to run, is to abandon the faith, is to rather than love God, to curse God. Matter of fact, that's what the counsel was by those closest to Job. As he was going through it, they said, why don't you just curse God and run and die? As they were going through it, they still had love and faith. And that's powerful. There's, it was so strong. And it was so, as we see here, even though they never seen him, they still love him and they still had faith in him. And so as we see, Paul praised them in that. Paul encouraged them that they still had love and faith. He said, though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you have not seen him, you still believe even in the midst of all the trials. He praised it because that was something different than he experienced. Peter loved him and believed him, but he seen him. He walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, had a personal intimate relationship with Jesus for three years. He saw him in his humanity as he walked with him, but he also got to see him in his divinity. On the Mount of Transfiguration, when he was lifted up, he saw the resurrected Jesus. And so it might be a little easier for Peter. After all, people always say, let me see and then I'll believe. But Peter was praising them because they hadn't seen and yet they still believe. But Peter had seen it and he believed. So he was praising them. He was lifting them up for it. And this is the type of love and faith that they had. And that's a reason to rejoice. Peter was blessed. You haven't even seen him, yet you still believe. But this wasn't just something that Peter was excited for them. Jesus himself would have been excited for them and for us. Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 20, he said, blessed are they who did not see and yet believe. Because Jesus understood that that was real faith. After he had rose from the grave, he appeared to his disciples and they touched his hands. He said, here I am. And then even doubting Thomas came to believe. And he says, blessed are those. Those are us. That's those that he's writing to an Asian minor. Though they have not seen, they still believe. We haven't seen. And that's interesting because even though they didn't get a chance to see the resurrected Christ like us, I believe that it's through trials, it's through the fire that we do get to see Jesus. I think it's during those times that we get to see him and his faithfulness more than ever. When we're going through trials, tribulations, and difficulty, I believe he's near, and he's right there more than ever. And I think I look back at times in my life, I've seen Jesus when I was going through it the most, when the fire was the hottest, when the trial was the largest, when the tribulation was the heaviest. That's when I got to see Jesus. And so I believe we do get to see just a little different than Peter did. And I think that's the exact same illustration that happened with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3. 
As you remember in Daniel chapter 3, they were going through a trial. When we talk about a fiery trial, that is literally what they were going through. Because they wouldn't bow down, because they wouldn't go along with what was going on in the world, they were literally thrown into the fiery furnace. And it was at that time when the trial was literally the hottest that they saw Jesus. But it wasn't just them. And, and that's the beauty. When we're going through it, and we're still rejoicing, and we're still clinging to Jesus, not only will we, will we, will, 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 <laughs> not only, <laughs> sorry, got a little, it's the DJ in me, you know, but um, not only will we see Jesus, others will as well. Remember when Jesus was in there, they were in there together, but those opened the door and they said, we, I thought we only threw three in there, but there's four and one looks like the son of God. Others saw Jesus as well. And I've seen Jesus in people's lives when I know what they're going through, when I know the pain, the, the agony, the trial, the heavy, all that they're going through, when I know what they're going through it and they are still rejoicing, I see Jesus in them. And so others will see Jesus as well, but as will we when we go through these trials and tribulations. And so the more we see his faithfulness, the more we love him, and the more our faith will grow in him. And that's a reason to greatly rejoice. It says more than greatly rejoice here in verse 8. It says joy inexpressible, full of glory. And this is a type of joy that only comes from being connected to the giver of joy. Jesus, who, through our love, through our faith in him, as we see, not only gives us joy, and expressible joy, full of glory, but also gives and provides, as we see in verse 9, salvation for our souls. And so, no matter what we're going through, no matter what trial, no matter how heavy it is, we see that we have four reasons to rejoice. And that those reasons, those four reasons is we have a living hope. The trial that we're going through, it won't last forever. We know that it's needed and necessary. And as we're going through it, we'll see Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come in Jesus' name. And we just thank you so much for your word, God. God, it's so encouraging to us today that no matter what we're going through, Lord, that we can rejoice. We have reasons to rejoice. We thank you for coming. We thank you for dying. We thank you that you are our joy, that you are the source of everything that we rejoice in because without you, we're dead. But because of you, we're alive. We have a living hope. God, we're so thankful that what we're going through won't last forever, that we will be with you. And whatever we're going through now won't even worth be comparing to the glory that will be revealed to us. And so in the meantime, God, we, your people, we... We understand that these trials are necessary. We understand that they're needed. And we choose to rejoice through them, to have joy in the midst of them. And we see you, Lord, knowing that you're working them for our good and for your glory. And so, Lord, I just want to pray for anyone, all of us here, who might be going through something today, that our hearts would be encouraged, that we would cling to the truth of your word, and we would apply it to our life. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, and we all say, amen. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with God, you haven't placed your faith in God, I want to give you that opportunity now. You might be here today and wondering, I, I, I'm separated from God. I feel like I'm so far from God. And it's the sin that separates us from God. But the good news is, is that he already dealt with sin. Jesus came and he took our sin upon him. The wages of sin is death. We deserve to die. But Jesus said, I'm going to take your place so that I can forgive you, so that I can cleanse you and have a relationship with you now and for eternity. And how we respond to that determines everything. When we talk about salvation of our souls, it's based upon our love and faith for God. Faith is believing. Do you believe what Jesus did was for you? If you believe it, you need to respond and receive it. Receive the free gift of salvation. Jesus said, for as many that received him, he's given them the right to become children of God. Today you can become a child of God. The work has been done. When he was on the cross and he said, it is finished, it means it is finished. He made a way for man to be reconciled to God, 
to be forgiven, to have a relationship. And if you don't have that, it, today's the day. Today's the day you turn your life around and over to God and place your faith in Him. And He makes you alive. He gives you salvation for your souls. What is salvation? What does being saved mean? Saved from the penalty of sin, separation from God, the power of sin. You will no longer be a slave. You can now walk and talk with God and soon it'll be the presence when we're with him in heaven. But it starts with one decision. Saying, God, I need you. I want you in my life and I want it today. Will you do that? Will you make that decision? I'm going to ask everybody to bow their heads and to close their eyes. And if you're here today and you're ready to receive Jesus Christ, you're done looking other places, you're done running from him, and today you want to run to him and receive him. I want to pray with you, and I want to pray for you. Will you stand right now if that's you? Go ahead and stand. I said, I'm ready. God bless you. God bless you. I'm going to ask that you to remain standing. We're going to pray together in a, in a moment. But if there's anyone else, today is the day. He said, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. If you open it up, I will come in. He loves you so much and his arms are open wide. He's saying, come to me. Allow me to forgive you. Allow me to cleanse you. The hard part has been done. I died for you. Receive forgiveness. Receive me today. Is there anybody else? Brother who's standing here, if you're watching online or in the fellowship hall, I just want you to repeat this prayer after me. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I have sinned and fallen short of your righteousness. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I receive you now as my Lord and my Savior. Please come into my heart and help me to live for you in all that I do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. May be seated. <clears throat> this time we're going to have an opportunity to commune with the Lord. And Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And so as we come, we come with the proper hearts. As we talk about trials today, as we come to the communion table, let's remember the greatest trial, which is the cross. And how Jesus endured it for us. And so let's commune now.
worship you in this place, Jesus. We give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. You alone, no man, there's no way for man to be saved except for your name, Jesus. There's power in your name. There's power in your blood. We remember the cross today. You told us to do this in remembrance of you. And the cup pictures your blood and the bread, your body, which was given for us. We know where our salvation is found. We know where our forgiveness is found. Then as we look back to the cross, but today, Lord, you tell us in your word when we sin, when we fall short, if we confess that you are faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us, Lord, we need cleansing today. Lord, we sin today. We fall short today, and we're thankful for your grace. So we confess those areas that we missed the mark, those areas that we fall short, Lord. We never want to use your grace as a license to, to sin, Lord. We want to be holy as you are holy, and so help us. Help us, Lord. Be more and more like you. We're thankful for the cross. We're thankful for your body, the blood. For times like this, we can find your grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's partake. Hope and pray you're encouraged today that no matter what you're going through, that we have reasons, four reasons, amongst many that we can rejoice in the midst of anything and everything. And so leave built up, leave encouraged, rejoicing, greatly rejoicing because of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you're here, you're struggling, you're hurting, just need to touch from the Lord. There's a prayer room to my right, your left. Let's go ahead and stand for our final song.